Well, it all began in 1989 with Terrific. And this trainer, he started with a bang. He also trained the Quinella because big super duper, superimposed, ran second. Then in 1992, it was the People's Horse Sub Zero. 1995, Doremus. Fast forward nine years and the second and third Melbourne Cups for Maccabi Diva, the famous Maccabi Diva, and no one will ever forget those days at Flemington. Lee Friedman was the trainer. Five Melbourne Cups in all, second only to the great Bart Cummings with 12. And there's certainly an art to winning the Melbourne Cup, so we thought we'd ask, well, the greatest living Melbourne Cup winning trainer, Lee Friedman, to join us on the Heart of Racing. I've got to apologise, Will's not here. He's had a major drama with a horse at the Rose Hill Stable today. So your nephew's not here. Uh, how are you, Lee? I'm good, thanks, Neil. And it's a pity Will's not there. I was going to give him a bake. So. <laughs> <laughs> what were you going to bake him about? Well, Let's know. bake him anyway. I'll work something out. <laughs> <laughs> there is an art to winning the Melbourne Cup, Lee, and obviously... Your training career from the late 80s for the next 20 years was was absolutely fabled. I suppose we'll go back to 1989. Terrific. When did you ever think that horse would win a Melbourne Cup? Well, he was an interesting horse because uh, he was bought by um, Barry Griffiths and his family uh, from a a guy in New Zealand who, uh, his name just escapes me now, but he stayed in the horse as well. And he came over here, uh, I think he'd only won a, maiden but he was he was bred to stay and uh we took him through his three-year-old year he's probably just below the best three-year-olds i think he won a st ledger in adelaide when they were still running the st ledger in adelaide and that sort of got us thinking that he might be a melbourne cup horse but he was just below that run um and then that spring i thought he ran pretty well he we put him on the typical path and uh he he probably, he ran in the McKinnon on the Saturday when we used to do that sort of thing. And I thought he ran pretty well. And he'd never been at 3,200 metres. And uh, uh, so, you know, those days it wasn't as hard to get into the race as it is now because obviously with the imported horses. But he got in and then he got a very, very fast run race, which was which was not always the case. And uh, he just won. And it was a bit of a surprise, but not an entirely a surprise because he, he was a good stayer, and he was he was uh, you know very fit and well that day. Right, he won well too. He won by a couple of lengths, and superimposed ran second. Did you think Super Duper could could have won a cup? I think he ran fourth again a couple of years later. He did to Let's Elope. He ran fourth to her, and he he ran in three Melbourne Cups. Actually, he ran again after his Cox Plate win, which I probably shouldn't have done because the track came up soft that day. I won it yeah. anyway with Sub Zero, but but I probably shouldn't have run him, and then we retired him straight after that. So going back to Terrific, and and then we'll get to towards Sub Zero. H- how do you get a horse ready for a Melbourne Cup? You know, you sort of thought, oh, this could be a Melbourne Cup horse, but I suppose there's the certain amount of kilometres you got to get in their legs. The old Bart Cummings method was, I think, it was ten kilometres worth of runs before yeah. a Melbourne Cup. Yeah, yeah. Look, um, there's 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 two Melbourne, two lots of Melbourne Cups. There's Pre Raiders and post Raiders, right? So post yeah. Raiders, I think we've probably, you know, dear old Bart taught me a lot, but I think post the English horses coming in '93, the first ones that came, um, the first ones that raided the race. There were other horses here before that, like that Shake Hamdan would send out to Colin Hayes. Uh, and they did. Yeah, like at Talek, at Talek and at horses Talek. like that. At Talak Kuds and uh, on those horses that won Cox Plates and that. I mean, Colin was onto something really, you know, before his time there because they they were getting horses that were far superior to what the stayers were here. Anyway, that beside that, um, yeah. So there's two distinct ways now. I mean, there's there's people who still follow exactly what he said, and that works well. The only difference is. Um, I don't think our horses are as strong as they were in the past. I mean, certainly my horses these days can't take the racing that horses took 30 years ago. I don't know why. Maybe we're breeding a weaker weaker breed um, and more sprinters. But, uh, yeah, I, I always subscribe to that theory, not so much the 10, 10 kilometres, but 
close enough to it. And I followed what, Felice. Four or five runs in yes. the cup, something like that? Yeah, absolutely. You didn't want to have more than five, maybe six runs. But I used to religiously, slavishly follow what Bart put down, as you do in any sport, you follow the best. And um, But as it was proven later on, that's not necessarily the only way to go. I mean, Bart used to say, you always have to run them on the Saturday, but everyone ran them on the Saturday. So it was a self-fulfilling yeah. prophecy in that respect that the cup winner would come from the runners on the Saturday, but they all ran on the Saturday. But, and, the, and the first year I didn't do that was, was Doremus um, because he was a very lightly framed horse. And he went straight from the Caulfield Cup into the Melbourne Cup uh, successfully. So, you know, there, there's many ways to prepare them, and it, and it very much depends on the horse whether he can take the sort of the old Bart preparation or whether uh, whether you have to go a different route. Now, when when Anthony and I brought Luke, Lucas Cranach out here in I think it was 2011, yeah, he. Uh, I ran him first up in the Caulfield Cup and second up in the Melbourne Cup. And he, without feet problems, he'd have won the Melbourne Cup because, you know, he, he'd had a restricted prep from the Caulfield Cup to the Melbourne Cup. And uh, he ran third to Dunedin, I think, uh, and Red Cadeau. So there was horse having his run second up in the Melbourne Cup. But he was bred to yeah. do that. Yeah, well, so, so you know, you look at those two different methods. So mm. I think if we look... You know, I didn't want to get into this year's Melbourne Cup yet, but I suppose if you look at it, Gold Trip is the second favourite, and mm. and it's had a bit of a, a Bart Cummings Lee Friedman type preparation. <laughs> it's had a it's had a lot of racing. You're going to have um, Valban, the English Raider, coming out. He hasn't raced since August, and then yep. you've got Without a Fight, which goes in third up and off a Caulfield Cup win, only two starts before the Cup. Yeah, which just emphasises how many different ways they're able to do it. Um, you mentioned those three. I mean, uh, Gold, Gold Trip certainly on his run on the Turnbull, uh, had he gone straight from there to the Cox Plate and run a placing in that, he'd have been nearly odds on in the Melbourne Cup. But I think probably people are thinking that, well, he's, he's they've thrown the other run in in the Cox Plate. And he ran well. He ran very well. Uh, and being an end tie, he'll probably get over that run pretty good. You know, that old testosterone helps when you... When you uh, when you're trying to recover, <laughs> yeah, not that I'd know, but <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, hey, Doremus, Doremus was Doremus was a classic case of a bit of a without a fight. No, no, I know without a fight's a different horse. He came out here, ran in the Melbourne Cup, and fired last year, but went up to Queensland and went bang bang. Doremus brought that great Queensland form with him mm. into a Melbourne Spring, didn't he? Mm, he did. And uh, it's been a tried and true method over the years, going right back to good trainers like Jeff, Jeff Murphy, who used to take his whole string up to Queensland for the winter. And we used to do it 30 years ago. But for some reason, we stopped. And when I say we, the Freedmans sort of kind of stopped doing it for a while. And then we've sort of rediscovered the value of doing that. And the boys are bringing a lot more horses up here for the winter now. Uh, it just makes sense. You know, the horses are, are in a milder climate. Uh, they love the change of you know, the change of training and the change of venue. And the beauty is once you've completed your prep, you can give them that three-week break up here, but in warm weather. Uh, Whereas if you go back home, you've got rotten weather and the horses just don't do as well. So if you can reintroduce the horse to to Melbourne in particular, when it's when it starts to get a bit spring-like, then it, you're going to get a pretty good effect from that. I'll backtrack a little bit from Doremus now to Sub-Zero. And it's a famous story now that the Freedmans and yourself, you, you bought that horse because you were trying to win a Magic Millions. Yep. Ridiculously, you end up winning a Melbourne Cup on a heavy track and he becomes one of the most favourite horses ever in this country. He became a cult hero. He did. Um, just a marvellous horse. I mean... Going up there and buying him as, as a potential Magic Million winner was probably, you know, pretty stupid because he didn't really look like a spreading horse. But then again, he didn't really have a stay as pedigree, either, except that his sire, I think Carla Dancer, had had, um, had some good staying wins in England. So he had that effect. And he's a Greg, so he got me in straight eye. I love Greg. So. Um, but, you know irrespective of his racing performances, and they were pretty damn good because apart from the Melbourne Cup, he won a South Australian Derby and a South, and, and an Adelaide Cup as well as a three-year-old. Yeah. Not many of them do. And um, he he was 
he was nailed on for a Melbourne Cup from, from that point. Um, given that they got a, a very wet spring, he would never have won a Melbourne Cup on a very firm track. And then post-racing, I think he's probably, I'm just looking at a picture of him here actually over in the corner. Um, not many horses make it to the wall in the house here, but he does. And um, But I think post-racing is where he he was fantastic because he, um, Graham, Graham took him on and I was more than happy for Graham to take him on post-racing because he'd always loved the horse. You know, to take him around all those hospitals and I went to a couple of hospices, children hospices, which is pretty upsetting. But the way he that horse went about and, uh, you know, bonded with people on those trips was just unbe unbelievable. And some of those kids had never seen a horse. And, you know, for people in very bad situations, they got a great, you could see the thrill they got out of, and some of them couldn't speak, but you could see in their faces that they got a great thrill out of that horse being able to walk in the door. And you could take him anywhere. He's been in lifts at the Hyatt Hotel and overseas. I think he, he did something in Dubai once, I think. Um, just an incredible horse. What a horse. Yeah. yeah he, he, he was a clerk of the course horse for he a was, while too. At yeah, he was. Great. Yeah. He used him for that for a long while. Um, and people forget that. That was another chapter of his career. And, um, you know, for a horse to have that longevity and then to live till he was like 28 or 30 anyway, um, I think Richard, my brother, was on the right track. He tried to get him nominated for Australia in a year. Yeah. <laughs> and they told him he couldn't do it. And he said, well, no, nothing says it has to be a human being. And they said, well, that's true, but I don't think it's going to go down too well if we have a horse. But he pursued pursued that for a couple of years. I think he tried a couple of times to get him. <laughs> and eventually got in the Racing Hall of Fame. Yeah, and so he should have too. What an absolutely unbelievable oh, horse. A brilliant horse. Not just for racing either. What, what was the thrill like for you, sort of 89, 92, 95? We'll get to Maccabi Diva soon. But in those years when, uh, you know, the Friedman Stable was quite dom dominant, there's thrills in racing. You know, you've got Super Duper going back to back to back to back in Epsoms and Doncasters mm. and you're winning Cox Plates and you've got Naturalism and Scalacci's winning Triple Crowns as a three-year-old. What's the thrill like for those things compared to winning a Melbourne Cup? Well, they're all pretty good. I mean, the Melbourne Cup has always been the pinnacle here. I mean, there were the, there'll be those now who challenge that and say that the Everest is probably the pinnacle. But I think if you asked... Money aside, I think if you ask most trainers what they'd like to do, it'd be to win a Melbourne Cup because it's so, it's such an iconic race and it's so well known overseas now too. So it was a great thrill. I think 89 was more of a huge shock than a thrill. Um, but you ran first and second. Yeah. Yes. Uh, no, that was a long night. I think I was. <laughs> <laughs> I think in those days they used to lead, we used to do a little, we started out pretty small on the course proper during Cup Week, we'd have a little marquee and then that grew into, grew into something like bloody Woodstock, you know, with, yeah. uh, with bands and beer companies wanting to sponsor us and all this sort of malarkey, but um, they were pretty fun and, and I, I, in those days they used to leave you on the course, you could go home when you liked, you could see stop that because it was apparently a bit of drama here and there and a bit of substance abuse and that sort of thing. But uh, <laughs> but uh, I think I ended up waking up on my couch up the hill in Esquivale in my suit with my binoculars around my neck. That's the sort of night it was, <laughs> which which prepared me perfectly had there been a race meeting Wednesday. <laughs> the Kitan Cup on Wednesday. I no, take I didn't, didn't make, make it. I definitely didn't make the Kitan Cup. Didn't make the no. Kitan Cup. I haven't made many Kitan Cups, to be honest, if at all. In in, in 95 with Doremus, it was the, the famous partnership with Damien Oliver, and we spoke to Ollie on the episode last week, and it was that famous shrill that he did when the you know he was interviewed on horseback on the way back to yeah. me. He sort of said, I just won the Melbourne Cup, and like the way he couldn't believe it. But you guys and Oliver combining... The only way you could have improved on that, being being an Aussie, is saying I just won the bloody Melbourne Cup, <laughs> which yeah, would have been threw perfect. Bloody in. Would have been perfect, but no, that was back in these days of having the long mullet, and I think that, I think he still had the <laughs> nose then. I've got I've got pictures of him here when he did have the nose, and now he's he's post nose surgery he looks different. But uh, yeah, they're all just yeah. That was a great, great thing. memories though. Oh, great memories because he had a he had a. Uh, a great association with the owners of that horse too, because most of them lived in Perth. And to this day, you know, a lot of those owners, 
particularly Rod Russell, who's a great, great friend of mine, lives in Perth, still has horses with me and still tells me I'm an imbecile and <laughs> pay my bills and stuff like that. So, But, he, but yeah, it, it was a great thing for Ollie because it was almost like a Perth win for him. Yeah. Also Keith Biggs, the illustrious Keith Biggs, who's about 85 now, I think, still going strong. And now, Lee, let's get on to Maccabi Diva. You, you know, it's a famous story. Now, you didn't train her in her first Melbourne Cup win, but you trained her for the second and third Melbourne Cup wins. There was enormous pressure on uh, to do that. What was it like to train that great mare and, and to come up with that record, as you said, after she won a third one, find me the youngest child here because that's the only person I'll see who will ha- ever happen again, and it won't happen again. No, it won't happen again. I never felt one bit of pressure training her, not once, because uh, she'd done a lot before we got her, and the expectation is that mares aren't going to go on and do what she did. So there wasn't any real pressure that she was going to achieve that. It was very interesting, though, because I think that's that's probably the best, well, it's the best horse I've trained, but it was also the best athlete I've trained, too, because the recovery from racing and work was just extraordinary. Like, she'd, she'd recover from things three times quicker than any other horse. And that's, I think if you speak to like running coaches or good tennis coaches or, or footballers for that matter, the, the, the very good ones, the work and the, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the sport doesn't hurt them, you know. And that was her. She was very good that way. Um, I was a bit, I didn't know, she got beaten in the Caulfield Cup before she won the first Melbourne Cup for me. And I, I thought, oh, maybe I haven't got her. 100% fit at this stage, and I rang David Hall in Hong Kong. The only time I've ever rang him about the horse, I mean, I see David at sales and stuff. We never really discuss it, but I rang him that night, and he said, no, no, that's her. Uh, I can, I know how you're training. Don't run her again and just push on with your work through to the cup. And he was right because he knew her very well too. Yeah, you said she was an extraordinary horse. She, she did things that other horses didn't do. She won a Sydney Cup in between mm. the first two Melbourne. No one even tries to do that, but she went to Sydney and won and then backed up in the spring. Actually, there's a bit of a story. I think this is a story with that Sydney Cup when David had her. Um, he wasn't even going to bring her up. She was entered, but she wasn't going to come up. And then when the race, he, so I think they decided to accept, and she was still in Melbourne, and they just whipped her up. On the, on the road a couple of days before the race and she won it because I ran third to her. I had Mama find it and he ran third to her. He could never beat it, never beat it. But, um, no, she was incredible. And I, I went to the races on that in, in 2004 and it was a, a, the big, a big storm came in and the, and, the, and the track went soft. And I was having lunch with an old mate of mine and he, he, he'd given up gambling, I think, not because he'd won too much, obviously. Uh, no one ever gives up gambling when they're winning too much, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> not to my knowledge. Anyway. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, but he'd given up. He, he, he wasn't even punting. And he, he said, oh, how do you think your mayor will go? And I said, and I, I swear to you, this is true. I said, I honestly think this is the greatest certainty I've ever settled up in a race, let alone a maidens, anything like that. Really? Yeah. And he picked up the phone and had 5,000 on it. <laughs> wow. You you were just that confident, like everything she was showing you and track work, everything about her. Was and then just, when the conditions w- went right for her, that just made me more confident because um, Dermot Weld had uh, Vinnie Rowe in the race and he was the European champion and brilliant horse, like just great stayer and the best stayer in Europe. And he brought him down here and I, I think, well, I know Dermot thought, because he said after the race, I thought my horse was a certainty, but he said that mare was just too good for him. And uh, they settled down to fight it out. I think we pinched a break on him about the two, 300, and then he came came with a run, but he, he couldn't get to within more than the length of it. She was just too good. But there was, a like, for you to be that confident, there hadn't been a, a back-to-back winner of the Cup since, what, well, think big, 30 years. Yeah. But when you've got something exceptional like her, and she mm. was pretty exceptional. Yeah, you know, like she's she's a she's a strata above any of the other horses I've won the cup with. There's no doubt about that. And uh, she couldn't have won four. She would have had the ability to win four, but the handicap would have beaten her. Yeah, but she in the in the third cup in 05, Did she carry? Was it fifty eight and a half? Yeah, and Bart Bart was still still kicking around. He <laughs> Bart always used to throw in barbs 
never speak directly, but he'd throw in barbs through the press. You know, he'd say, well, of course it should win. It's been thrown in the race. But the fact yeah. of life was she set the weight carrying record for a mare, as I explained to him. Uh, she set the weight carrying record for a mare the previous year. So this was like a super record. She had to set a record again. What was it the previous year? Was it 55 and a half second time around? Or? Yeah, I yeah. think so, yeah. She was probably a good thing then. But, but I, I, I... 58 and a half is a lot for a mare. Gold triple run with 58 and a half this year mm. um, after it carried 57 and a half to win last year. So you He's know, actually well in. He's well he's in at 58 and a half. Yeah, he is. And he, he'll be very hard to beat, I think. He loves Flemington, as did McLeod. loves Flemington. Never. They get a bit of rain, they probably won't beat him. Yeah, he, he, he'll be really hard to beat. Mm. That so, so it was a famous line from yours, but you had thought about it about and the, oh, the, no. the, the seas parted for her that day. <laughs> no, sorry, I'll get it. The seas parted for her that day. It was like a destiny. I was there, and as yeah. I was watching a win, I was going. I know there's a hundred thousand people here, but I'm the biggest dickhead here because I haven't backed her. You, you know, like mm. why wouldn't you back her? But, mm. you know, and you, 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 said, you said the line about the, the youngest child, but, you know, it'll go down in history, you know. Fortunately for the rank and file, the average, the average week-to-week punter, they don't, they don't take too much notice of the so-called experts. They, they love that horse. So they all, when, when it was in, they backed it. Well, I've only had two. I've had two fillies make the front page of the Herald Sun. One was her, and the other was Emma the other day. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Your daughter, by me. yeah, by me. So, uh, but yeah, the average. What I'm trying to say is, the average punter doesn't listen to the that they have the horses they love and they back them. You know, yeah. and of course she was so famous, and she was so well liked and well loved. She um, people just backed her. And I know for a fact all the all the so called form experts and the blokes who make a living out of it have her not winning. Yeah. yeah. And yet they didn't. Uh, fortunately, I didn't know that until after the race, which is good. Well, I can tell you, my wife backed her in all three cups. And Did she really? Yeah, she 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 picked her out the first time. Then the next year she went again, and the next year she went again, and then and I didn't, and I was at Flemington, and she she just said to me, "You're just an idiot." Yeah. Oh, look, I think she was being a bit harsh. Um, <laughs> no, she wasn't. <laughs> I got him. No, no, she wasn't. Um, no, um, but, yeah, that's that's how that came. And I think she actually firmed on the day. She was about 350, went off about 350 favourite on the day. And it was an extraordinary ride. But as he tells you himself, Glenn Boss, she used to take the runs herself. She knew where she was going. She'd, she'd, she'd be motoring along. And he said, I'd go to move that way. And she was already taking him into Already that there. She knew it. She, she, she was otherworldly with that sort of thing. And the last thing I said to him was, uh, after the race, was when he went for that run on the corner, he'd come out about four or five. He got a lovely run up and got out four or five, which is the perfect trail into a Melbourne Cup, and went for a run on the outside. And the ho- I don't know what the horse was, rolled in. And as it rolled in, it pushed him back, but it pushed him into another gap. Like it was... Well, no, no, it that's what I said. The pushed him into parted. a hole. It was just ridiculous. And that's you know? what it was, it was absolutely amazing. How's life for you mm. these days, Lee? You obviously went off to Singapore and you've come back now and you're training out of the Gold Coast. The Singapore situation seems to be a disaster for racing fans. They're going to shut the track down there. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it is a great shame that it had the, it had a massive potential, that place. And even the first couple of years we were there, that it was just a fantastic place to work and race and um and but the people running it have got no idea. They've just stuffed the whole thing up, and then want to then can't seem to devise any sort of a way to get themselves out of the hole. So they just shut it. And how's training on the Gold Coast? Geez, you'd be keen to, for them to get back on the turf and get off that dirt. <laughs> <laughs> I know about that. That poly's been pretty sweet to me the last few. Oh, weeks. has it? So I've had I've had a few. I've found a couple that actually love it. They can't win anywhere else, but they love it. Some horses go and on it. I've been watching the races there. When a horse wins there, back at next start, it'll win again. Yeah, that's it. It's definitely horses for courses there. So if you find one that's bolted up a maiden and you see it in a 58 or a class one the next week, get on it again. Um, but no, we will be. The track's looking unbelievable up here. And I, you know, it was a strange decision to come here, but I didn't really want to go back to Sydney or Melbourne. I definitely didn't want to go back to Melbourne after living in Singapore in the heat for three years. So 
initially I looked at the Sunshine Coast and it didn't quite fit. And um, and then they told me about all the improvements they were making here, and I thought that's not that's not a bad idea, you know. And the only trouble is that with COVID then and post COVID with the problem with um, supply lines and staffing things and that it's just taken a year longer or 18 months longer than I thought it would to get up. But it's it's going to get up. The track's ready. The track's ready for use this month, end of this month, and um, or early December, and um, and the stabling's been slow, but it's coming along. Um, so yeah, look, it'll be really good. And when they get the night racing up here, that'll be sensational because I think Gold Coast really lends itself to night racing. Yeah, fantastic. And the Gold Coast, what a great place to live. Lee Friedman, you're a lucky man to be living there. Well, we got to the art of winning a <laughs> Melbourne Cup today with Lee Friedman. Find a good horse, keep it injury-free, and let it fly on the big day. That's basically it, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, pretty simple. <laughs> <laughs> Especially when you've won five. Lee, it was a, yeah. it was a pleasure to talk to you. I'll, uh, I'll keep you posted on, um, on your nephew Will's drama at Rose Hill, which kept him away from us okay. today. It's been great spending some time with you, and they were absolutely famous days. Good on you, Lee. Enjoy the Gold Coast. (laughs) Thanks, Neil. With the summer of tennis right around the corner, Wide World of Sports has every angle covered. From match highlights, press conferences, and every breaking news story, Wide World of Sports is your home of tennis. So click that subscribe button so you don't miss a thing this summer.